Hey, wow, huge shout out to Earth, Wind & Fiber. The, all those early mornings, 6 a.m. trainings really paid off. Congrats, guys. Uh, condolences, amazing answers. Um, there's the survey that was wrong. Well, hey, everybody, on that note, we're going to pray before we read the Bible to transition out of family feud in our spirits. So, Father, help get that out of our minds. <laughs> Uh, God, God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for who you are. And I pray that we would have open hearts and open minds as we open your scripture, we open your holy words, God, that we would each be in a place where we're able to even understand and accept how much you love us. And I pray that this Christmas season uh, wouldn't only be about uh, fun and friends, but it would um, be about the core message of understanding your love for us and how your love breaks through into our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the darkest place I can ever remember being was in a cave as a kid. Uh, about one or two hours north of here is the Ape Caves. Have you been to the Ape Caves? Oh, popular spot. Okay, so you go down. If you take the easy route, you go. It's about three-quarter miles back to the back of the cave, and in there is inky black. And you cannot, you can't see your hand in front of your face, literally. Uh, so I was in there hiking as maybe a 12-year-old and going through. I'm a part of a bigger group, so there's all these adults with lanterns and this and me and a couple of friends. And I've got one of those big old black mag light flashlights, the old school ones that you can kill someone with if you wanted to, but frowned upon. So it starts to go dim, starts to go, starts to go out. But I'm with the group, I'm fine, but, but when it starts to, to go out a little bit, I have this thought. I was like, I bet I could make it back in the dark. I bet I could get through. And so I grab a couple of other 12-year-olds. Uh, I was like, hey, guys, guys, do you think we can make it through in the dark? And they're like, yeah. We go, let's run. And we're like, yeah, because we're idiots, right? And so we turn, and we're just full confidence, take off running through the ape caves. And I just went awesome for like five seconds, maybe 10, depending on, right? And it only took uh, a really good to the head or some bloody chins on a rock where we were humbled a little bit. And we, uh, we compromised, I'll admit it, we compromised. We turned from let's run to, to this one, to like you're kind of going in the deep end and you don't know how deep it is. Um, we would bump into other groups and kind of walk by their light for a little bit to, to go. We didn't turn our lights on, but we just happened to follow other groups for like a quarter mile. But as we get towards the end, you know, we're, we're going to do this, we make it, and um, it must have been that last quarter mile of it was just pitch black. And your eyes just acclimate to having no light. You just, you, your body accepts it and it becomes normal. But as we come around the last corner of the cave, um, it, there's this massive opening. And there, it's probably 50 feet across where just the, the ceiling of the cave is open and the light of day just bursts in. It was painful because we were so used to being in the dark. And some of us even kind of turned back and went back into the cave a little bit to let our eyes adjust a little bit because adjusting to the light was more painful than running through the dark. Um, but we were meant to live in the light. Um, physically, spiritually, in all ways, we we're people who were made to live in the light. And that's, I tell that story to, to bring us to our teaching series in Christmas. We're talking about the hymns of heaven, the, the famous hymns and Christmas carols that have been sung for hundreds of years that are part of the tradition of our faith. And, and today is one I'm calling Heaven Breaks Through. The, the, the light of heaven breaks through into this world in a pretty dramatic way. Last week, Pastor Dave, he talked about our longing for the world to be made right. He talked about how even though we're in a dark world sometimes, we all universally across the planet, we know that we want this place to be made right. And we want someone to come help, someone to come fix it. We look for a hero. We watch movies like Avengers and Batman because there's this universal fantasy of going, if somebody could just come fix this thing. So we looked at, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. God, come be with us. Make this right. And today we're going to talk about the announcement that, that God did come. The time when, when the announcement comes in the Bible saying, hey, he's here. The, the, the Savior, the hero, the Messiah, as it's called in the Bible, he showed up to make things right, and, and that's what Christmas is about. But before we talk about what the hymn is, before we unpack it, I want to tell you a little bit about who wrote it. I want to talk to you about the author whose name is Charles. 
Charles, uh, he was born in 1707 to a Christian family in England, had like a dozen big brothers and sisters, uh, born into a huge family. He grew up super bright, ended up going to Oxford at the age of 18, and when he got to Oxford, he started a little Bible study. He and two friends got together, and they got a reputation. They were known as the Holy Club. That's quite a nickname, right? So these three guys, they were known for going to church or mass like every single day. They were known for methodically studying their Bible, just going line by line through the whole thing, just chewing on scripture. And they were also known for living out their faith. They would um, have a habit of going to the filthy prisons around Oxford, going and visiting the inmates, encouraging them, and saying, hey, hey, God's a God of second chances, trying to be an encouragement. So the little group of three turned into four, turned into five. Eventually, even Charles's big brother, John, joins the group. John was a much stronger leader than Charles. He, he took over and started leading the group. And as the group grew, so did people making fun of them. And they got a derogatory nickname. Uh, the people at Oxford started calling them Methodists because of the method that they so methodically studied the Bible with. And as it turns out, more people were inspired by what they did then uh, railed against it because today there's over 80 million Methodists in the world. And, and, and some branches of Methodism have, have veered off of being sound doctrine uh, following the scriptures, but at the beginning, at the core, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people got to know the love of Christ. Over the three centuries since that happened, millions of hungry bellies have been filled by this little holy club Countless prisoners have been encouraged that our God's not a God of being stuck in shame, but he's a God of second chances, that you can come out of prison and addiction and a dark life. Millions upon millions of families have found hope to anchor their lives in. So if nothing else, before reading this hymn, I want to give an encouragement that if you are trying to walk out your faith and you have people who are making fun of you, you know, I met somebody who's at Camus High School this morning, you know, people in secular workplaces, people whose neighbors aren't fans that you're a Christian. Uh, if you're doing something, if you have the courage to be about your faith, um, people will make fun of you. But my encouragement is think of the generations after you. People like John and Charles Wesley, the founders of the Methodist movement, they didn't back off. They continued to serve the poor, love those in prisons, and to write songs. So Charles Wesley, when he was about 30 years old, had a spiritual awakening. He actually had a whole bunch of failures in his life. And then God turned his life upside down, and he started writing hymns. And his brother, his, his now famous brother, this is, we're getting towards 1739, but his, his brother John said this about him. He said, Charles' hymnal, it, it was the best theological book in existence. The songs that he wrote in the 18th century, his brother John said, you can look anywhere, this is the best theology. The reason he said that about his brother is because his brother wrote those songs with a heart to help us understand God. Because in that time, most people were illiterate where they were doing ministry. These guys, they were visiting in prison. They couldn't hand them a copy of the Bible. They can't read. So Charles set out to write what is the gospel story? What, what is the actual meaning of the gospel in words? So when you sing it, you'd remember and they could hold on to that hope. So we're going to zero in on probably Charles Wesley's most famous hymn that he wrote. And uh, it was originally called A Hymn for Christmas, but we know it by a different title today. And I want to see if you guys can uh, pick out which one it is by the opening line. It starts out like this. Hark. Oh, 10 points, right? Hark. This first line means to pay attention, listen up, there's an announcement coming. If you watch a movie like Cinderella, there'd be a fancy dressed man showing up on behalf of the king. Hear ye, hear ye, the king has an announcement, right? It's hark, listen, pay attention, something's about to be announced by the royalty. And then it goes into the next line, which is the herald angels sing. And when we say this, a lot of times we say, hark, the herald angels sing, but it's, it's hark, the herald angels sing, the messenger angels. What this is saying is there's an announcement from heaven, and yet in the Christian faith, we do believe in God and angels in heaven. We believe there's more to this life than just the physical. We believe there's a soul. And we believe that 
the first Christmas was a message of God sending messengers from heaven to say, there's a big announcement that's beyond this world. That's a bigger deal to it. The herald angels sing. Well, what is that message? Glory to the newborn king. It's the announcement that a king is coming, a heavenly king. Um, and so in their minds, the people who received this message initially, they probably would have went, well, a heavenly king? You mean like Zeus or Caesar? What? Um, the, the Jewish people who originally heard this, they would have been probably pretty suspicious of a new king. Uh, they were longing for the what they called the Messiah to come, but also the last couple of dozen kings they have, um, bad king after bad king after bad king. What they believed about the gods was that the gods were not friendly. What they believed about the Roman Empire in charge of the time, these were not people that were your buddies. Politicians were not your friends. They might kill your family if you stepped out of line. And so there's this wondering, well, what's this king going to be about? What, what is he like? And so Charles Wesley, in, in one of the most succinct statements of, of the heart of the Christian faith, put it like this. He said, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. The peace on earth, that's God's hope for us. Peace, peace in our own lives. Those late nights, if, if we're willing to turn off Netflix and pop out the earbuds and just sit and look at our lives for a second. Peace in relationships, reconciled with other people, peace in the world, that's God's goal. And he didn't go after it the way the Romans did. The Romans believed in the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, which they got peace by, if you're not peaceful, we will kill you, which is a bit of an irony there. But um, God goes about it in a different way. He goes about it through mercy. Mercy in the Bible is often translated loving kindness. So that is God, that is how God works, as he works to win hearts to, to through his grace, through his forbearance, through his loving kindness, his mercy, that he wants to draw people into a peaceful life. And then the, the punchline of the whole song, God and sinners reconciled. A hymn for Christmas. What is Christmas about? Christmas is about God reaching down into the world and saying, I know that this is a broken world. I know that there's sinners here. I know that you're sinners. Keith, I know that you are the chief among these, right? That, but, but I want to be right with you. And the deepest longings of our heart that we be made right with God. And then Wesley turns the hymn on, on its hinges there and he finishes the last one. It just goes into celebration. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies with angelic host proclaim. Christ is born in Bethlehem. And so he's clearly referring to a Bible story here, a Bible story of much celebration about God coming down to be reconciled to us. And it's in the famous part of scripture, Luke chapter two. Now, if you've been alive for more than five seconds, you have probably had Luke chapter two read at some Christmas service by a grandma at a Catholic service at anywhere on the street in Charlie Brown. Luke two gets read everywhere. And so what Charles was doing is taking the message of, of Luke 2 and bringing it in front of us. But I wanted to start out by just explaining a little bit of the backstory of Luke 2. Um, if you have heard the opening lines of Luke 2, you might remember them like this in most of our translations. Uh, it would go, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And at that point, if you've heard it, a lot of times the Christmas fuzzies come in and be like, oh, we're about to watch cartoons. I can almost taste the eggnog, right? But if we look at the story, Caesar was not showing up to give people eggnog. Like, he was not a nice guy. The, the, the story is actually that there was a government-mandated relocation for everybody, including a 15, 16, 17-year-old girl named Mary. Now, we have a couple of young ladies in our church right now who are in their third trimester of pregnancy. You know, go get it. You guys are, I talked to some first service. But um, the picture is that because the government wanted people to pay taxes, they say, hey, guess what? You get some holiday travel. We need you to walk to your hometown. And so pregnant Mary had to walk, and if she was lucky, get on the back of a donkey for a while, 70 miles I don't know if you can imagine being eight months pregnant and walking 70 miles because the government told you they would kill you and your family if you didn't go pay your taxes. They walked, it'd be like walking past Salem. 
She walks and she walks and she gets there. And we pick up this story after the government has said, you got to go do this. And we zoom in on Mary after a 70-mile journey where she shows up. And this is the kind of greeting she receives in Bethlehem where she has gone to be registered for tax purposes. And Mary, she gets there and she gives birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. When she wraps him in swaddling cloths, uh, it's a picture of a mother's care in the middle of a hard circumstance, of a mother protecting her child no matter what's going on around it. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. I want you to notice something about this story. Uh, we're, we're eight verses in at this point, and before God enters the story, this is a dark and grimy story. This is a bleak story. We, we doll up Christmas, and we, it's like we want to give Christmas glamour shots. We get it all ready, and we have the little nativity scene. I brought a picture of what um, a lot of our nativity scenes look like. We have um, a Swedish family um, who has been airbrushed and makeup already. You've got the lamb and the chicken posing for the picture, right? And everybody's just kind of huddled around this Christmas lights. Like Jesus wasn't born at a wedding venue. He wasn't born in some barn with Christmas lights and little drinks set out, okay? When it says that he was born in a manger and there was no room in the house, uh, Jesus was either born in a cave where the animals dwelt at night or this, this is a picture uh, in the Middle East of an ancient house that sometimes there'd be guest rooms off to the side. So best case scenario, this area hewn out of rock on the outside of the house. People say, you're a teenage girl who's pregnant, not married. Yeah, sorry, we don't have room in here for you. You can go sleep out with the animals. And she gave birth on a rock floor. The manger carved out of stone. It's not like a neat little wooden trinket made by, no, they, they carved it out and they fed animals there. That was the first Christmas. Shepherds in a field at night. And so when we doll up the Christmas story, we lose part of the heart of it. The, the story gets really good in the second half, but if we forget that God was coming into a dark world, we're not understanding what Christmas is about. The reason we all put lights on our house and on our trees is to remember that at nighttime when they look so beautiful, that's a picture of who God is and what he's about. And when we drive around and look at Christmas lights, it should be like, ah, just like that light is shining on a dark night, not on a beautiful silent night like the song says. So sometimes, sometimes we can look at this world like I'm sure Mary and Joseph did. Mary and Joseph are there, dark night, the shepherds in the field nearby, they're surrounded by the lowest in society. And we can go, God, where are you? I'm eight verses in and I haven't seen any lights from heaven. I'm working on travel with the in-laws, trying to figure out my taxes, trying to figure out this government, trying to figure, where, where are you, God? What is happening? And, and that's when God meets us. That's when heaven breaks through right in the midst of this. And I want to read the next part of the story. Because it is a dark story until heaven breaks through. So Luke 2, 9 is a turning point in the story. We're talking about the shepherds. The shepherds are out in the field at night. They're, they're hanging out, living there. And it says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, to those shepherd, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I love how the NLT says it. It says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared amongst those shepherds and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. This, this word uh, shone around them or surrounded them, the word is perilampo in the Greek. And it's this idea of shining like a lamp all around, that light encompassing everything that's happening. It's an idea that comes again and again and again in scripture. When things are dark, when we're a couple of years in a dark road, when we're eight verses into a story going, God, where are you? God shows up. And he showed up in the form of a herald, a messenger angel with a message for them. But at first, they're terrified. But I want to focus on a minute for this idea of God's light breaking through in a dark space because this isn't the only point in Scripture. Um, there's a dozen stories, but one of my favorite one is the story of Paul. St. Paul, the Apostle Paul. St. Paul was somebody who, before he met Jesus, before God showed up in his life, he was a very religious, 
and violent man, probably pretty racist as well. And he's going through his life, and as he, I don't know, he might have been 20, 25 years old, um, he was starting to gain esteem in the local church, and he actually got approval from the local religious leaders to hunt down Christians, throw them in jail, and when he saw them killed, he got a big pat on the back. Later in Paul's life, towards the very end of it, in Acts 26, Paul is telling about, I remember back when I was young, when I was a violent man, and, and I, know, I know this is our story of some of us in the room where we show up at church and, hi, how you doing, Kate? But when we're at home, when no one's watching, there's a rage in us that we don't know how to control. That was Paul. That was the guy who wrote a big chunk of the Bible, but, but something happened to him that I want to look at in Acts 26. Acts 26, Paul is looking back on his life, telling the story about his journeys to go persecute Christians. It says, on one of these journeys, I was going to the city of Damascus with authority and commission of the chief priests. I had permission to throw people in jail. And about noon, King Agrippa, King Agrippa is uh, the king he was telling the story to. At about noon, King Agrippa, I was on the road and I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions, and we all fell to the ground. God shows up and just knocks Paul off his horse, completely humbles him. Many of us in this church, if we've been here a while, we're ones who have that story. We were going one direction. We were going towards violence or greed or I don't care about anybody around me or I'm addicted to these dopamine hits and God just humbled us and took us a different way. And that, that's, that's my story. I didn't, wasn't riding on a horse at the particular time, but it was equally as odd for me. When I was 16 years old, not a crit, would not talk about God in the day to day, not following Jesus, wouldn't have thought about the Bible, just living my life what I thought was most fun. And during the national anthem of a basketball game, God just showed up and hit me right in the chest. I didn't even know it was him at a time, but was just confronted with a question. Hey, if you think basketball matters, hey, maybe everything matters. What was, like, what, like I had never had a spiritual experience before. It sent me on a quest of this, this searching in my life, and about four years later, as I'm about to turn 21 years old, a friend invited me to church on Sunday morning. And I was like, yeah, if I'm sober, I guess I'll, I can go, you know. So get up, go with a friend to church, and the sermon is about the gospel. It's about God's love breaking through into our world and setting us on a new course. And I just hit me in the chest and changed the course of my life from leaving, living completely for myself with my highest ethic was, is it fun to, uh, there's this new way to go that I don't even know what it is. Many of us have had the story like Paul where we've been, uh, hit from a light from heaven. It looks different for all of us, but it's a way where God takes us and turns us into a new course. So I wanted to hit on one thing to, to turn the corner to finish the sermon out today, and it's this idea that the way the announcement was made that Jesus is coming means everything. The manner in which the presentation, uh, the manner in which he was born, it says so much to us because Jesus intentionally was not born with the rich and the beautiful. The announcement didn't come like Cinderella with stepping out in the town square. The announcement came to shepherds sleeping in the dirt. This was, you know, if you have a rung of society, these guys are at the bottom. They're living with animals sleeping on the ground. He was born in a manger in, in a cave or at least excluded from the house. So wh why would God choose to be born that way? Why, why would he choose to show up in that? And, and as, as we look at the backside of this story, um, it's important to remember the situation that he was born in. So I want to read Luke 2, what's our next verse? 2.10. The angel shows up. It says, the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid. Hey, I know I popped out of nowhere and freaked you out, but just, it's cool. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. All people. Can we say that? What kind of people? All people. That was not the norm at the time. It wasn't, oh, value the downtrodden. That was not the Roman ethic. 
God intentionally announced to shepherds and was born on a dark night in exclusion to show that his grace extends to everybody. And the angel explicitly says it. He shows up and goes, hey, this message is for everybody. This isn't for kings and queens. This isn't the gods are happy with the rich. This is for everybody. And that's why the history of Christianity is about people like John and Charles Wesley showing up at prisons to, to encourage people, not ruling with the elite. And just explicitly, Christianity is not a winner's religion. Christianity is about loving the needy, the hurt, the broken. And, and oftentimes that message transforms people's life and they do find success later. But Christianity is about loving people right where they are, all people. Left, right, old, young, every single person in this auditorium, out in the street, everybody. God came for everyone. And that is why he chose to come and be born in a manger so that nobody else could look at him and go, ah, Jesus is too good for me. No, Jesus wants to come meet us right where we're at. So I want to pull the rest of the story in Luke 2, 10 through 14 and to see the rest of it because this message that God is there for all people is, is really valuable to look at. And it goes like this. The angel said to the shepherds, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for what kind of people? All people. That's me. Okay. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The Messiah is the one they were waiting for, the one that they had hoped to come make things right. And this will be a sign to you. He says, listen, shepherds, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And like, okay, there's going to be a king born laying in an animal trough. That's a pretty clear sign. We will go look for that. But suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, and, and it's worth pausing here. It says, a great company of the heavenly host. That word host, it could mean the armies of heaven. There was a, a military attitude to it. A great company has the idea of all, all the angels. So picture you're up in heaven and they're like, today's big announcement day. Jesus is being bored. Yeah, Timmy gets to make the announcement. But did you hear everybody's invited to be in the choir? I'm going. Bill, you have to stay. You got the gates and the night shift. But everybody else, you're invited. We're going down. And so they go down, and it says that that singular angel was there to deliver the message, but then all of heaven showed up, and all of its glory on a dark night lit up the sky, and they celebrated the fact that Jesus was born and coming into the world. And they said it like this, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. 300 years ago, Charles Wesley wanted everybody to know this. The, the young, the old, those in prison, those who are illiterate, and he put it in words in a song because everybody can remember a song. And he wrote down those words to summarize this whole story to the people who couldn't read. He said, listen, just, just sing it like this. Just hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. This, this king's coming to bring peace and mercy and he's gonna reconcile you to God no matter who you are. All the nations should celebrate this and join the triumph of the skies. He's summarizing the story in a way that we can remember even the least of these. So the Christmas story is about God showing up right in the heart of the mess. Heaven's glory coming down to be with us. And so I wanna finish today with trying to give a picture of heaven. Because Man, sometimes when we, when we say, hey, God loves you, he's up in heaven, we think, okay, there's an old guy sitting on a chair up in space who really likes me. Like, wh why is that good news? Um, when we think of love, when we think of joy, a lot of times the only way that we have to compare that is if we think of the people around us who are really nice. We might think, oh, the way uh, the grandparents love the grandkids, that's kind of heavenly. A, a, a newlywed couple madly in love. Uh, maybe friends who have had each other's backs in the foxhole or um, a, f a mother and father's love for a child. We, we think of these things. But what I want to ask you to do is just a little mental exercise. I want you to try to think of the most loving person you have ever met in your life. Just take, take a minute. The most loving, kindest person. And if, if you have it, if you have their face, can you just give me a little, or like a wink in the gun or something? Some kind of nod. We got one. 
We need about 300 more, okay. All right, so take that person. <sighs> Human love is, is so small compared to the grandeur of God's love, of, of how massively he cares for us. And when I tried to think of an illustration, I've been combing the last two weeks to try to think of a picture of how much bigger is God's love than ours. And, and I don't think we'll fully get to see it till heaven. But I found a video clip that I want to give me 30 seconds to tell you about it before we watch it. But that I think that gives a picture from heaven. Because this story, the Christmas story, is on kind of a dark, stormy night. There's shepherds in a field. There's a pregnant mom who's being oppressed by the government, right? Um, we get the earthly view from kind of down in the pit, from down in the cave. But I was like, well, what does it look like from heaven? What, what does it look like for the heavens to celebrate? And so I came across this video that, that um, a lot of you probably have seen, but I think it's appropriate in this context. It's from 2013 in Romania. Um, there was a little three-year-old boy playing by his house, and he fell into a well. Uh, he fell down a pipe that's about 18 inches he went down 40 or 50 feet, stuck down at the bottom, couldn't get out. And he was stuck there for about 11 hours, overnight into the next day. And his parents know that he's down there. They can hear him. The, 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 the hole's right there, right? But they can't get to him. And so they rally the town. And you'll start to, in the video, you'll see dozens of men from the town coming out, trying to dig him out. They've got a hole that's about 15 feet deep. They've got a backhoe pulling things out. But nobody in the town is strong enough to reach him. Nobody is big enough to fix this. It, it, and in the same way, in, in an ironic twist, is nobody is small enough to fix this. He, he, the hole's this big. You'll, you'll see the father, he's in a green shirt and he's walking around just out of his mind because he can't get down the hole, he's too big. Nobody was small enough to relate to him. The boy is utterly lost down in the pit, okay? Until this skinny little 14-year-old boy whose name was Christian, <laughs> hey Christian, uh, he, he says, I'll go. I'll go down. He volunteers to get strapped up and be sent down head first down into this well to see if he can grab this kid and pull him out. So I want you particularly to keep an eye on, on the teenage boy and the father in the green shirt. Let's, let's watch the video. This is like the 17th time I've watched this and I'm totally still not crying every time I... But do you see the father's love when he gets his child back? I mean, do you see how he hugs him and he kisses him? I pray that this church will never forget Luke chapter 15, the story of the lost son, the story of God the father waiting at the porch, waiting for his son to come back, waiting, scanning the hills. And when he sees him, he runs after him and it says he fell on his neck and kissed him. That's the best picture I've seen of that in a long time. That, that, that God's heart is to be reconciled to us. And did you see the community? I mean, there's people standing in the background. There's people with shovels working. But when that boy comes up, I mean, it's hugs and it's kisses. Grown men kissing each other and hugging and not in a weird way. In a way that's just like, man, this is the, wor the way the world's meant to be. High fives, cheers erupt from everybody. That is heaven. 
okay, heaven is not some dark, cold place. Heaven is full of the glory of God the Father, of his son Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit of God. It's full of the angels and the saints and those who have been interceding for the lost. All the grandmas and mamas out there who've been praying for their communities for 40, 50 years. I, I know you guys. I love that you guys are praying. The community of heaven celebrates. And man, that kid, that 14-year-old kid, what a picture of Jesus to say, I'll go. I'll go down on a dark night. I'll go down into the pit. I'll go down head first and get involved in that. I'll put my own life at risk. Okay, because it was Jesus. It was Jesus who was willing to be born in a manger and to give us a hand and say, hey, do you want a new life? And he offers us a hand that's tethered to heaven that if we grab on, he can pull us up into the community of God. We say a lot in the church, um, the, the Lord's Prayer, uh, we want this place to be um, on earth as it is in heaven. And we fall short of that as a church all the time. But man, the, the invitation is to come up and join the celebration of the saints that if anybody turns back to God, if anybody comes to him, that we celebrate like crazy because somebody who is lost is found. Do you enjoy seeing that, Grace Church? You ever seen somebody's life changed? I love it. The, the, the verse starts to conclude with, well, what do we do with this, right? And, and the question that I want to put in front of you today, and it's on the, uh, the little handout, the little slip of paper that you got. There's one question on there and a bunch of blank space. And it says, how will you respond to him? The angels showed up and on the dark night said, hey, a king's going to be go- born that's going to give you new life. You've heard the gospel here today. The question is, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to respond to it? I want to finish by just reading what the shepherds did and then give a, a challenge to two different groups of people here and then we'll, we'll finish out with a song. But the shepherds, when they heard this, responded like this. The angels show up and they declare, hey, the angels are singing glory to the newborn king. So the shepherds said this. They said, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. They didn't finish their email. They didn't get through season. They didn't do one more thing. They stopped what they were doing in the middle of work and they hurried off to go find Jesus. They hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had told him. The shepherds went and found Jesus. Jesus. Have you dug in and uh, over everything, above work, above family, have you gone to try to find Jesus? Because the scripture promises if you look for him, you will find him and your life will be transformed. I would not be up here at a church on a stage if God had not come and given me the message of the good news. And when I went looking for Jesus, I found him and it changed my life from going one way to a complete different direction. That invitation is for every single person. To, to go find Jesus. And the promise in the scriptures, you will not be disappointed. Jesus will give you new life. So that's the invitation. It, and, and it comes out in two ways. One question is for those of us who don't know Christ. We wouldn't say, like me, much of my life, I wasn't following Jesus. I'm not a Christian. If, if that's you, is, is do you want to be saved? Do you want the real thing? Are, are you at a point where you go, I want to get rid of this life, the, the jealousy, the anger, the pride, the greed, all, all the junk, all the lies, all the fake. Do I want the real thing? Do I want full life? And the invitation is to grab Jesus' hand and accept being rescued. And anybody, anybody who is humble enough to accept Jesus as king, he wants to invite us into a new life, yes, now, but, but also in heaven, in the life to come. The invitation is there for you, and, and, and take it, take it. it. A lot of us go, I, I don't know where to start. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And just look, start anywhere. Start. There's a little thing in the back of your seat that says, connect, put your name on it. Come talk to somebody after the service. Sing passionately to the song at the end. Go to the prayer wall. You know it because it says prayer on the wall, right? Go there and just... Like, I don't, I feel like I want to follow Jesus, but I don't know how to do that. Will you help? Every inch of this building, every part of our community is designed to help people follow Jesus because we truly believe that there's new life found in him. That so many of us here have been on that path. 
take the invitation. But, but the second group of people is for those of us who say, I, I am a Christian. I know this story. I know the Christmas story. I know Jesus died for my sin. So the question for the rest of us is, do you actually live your life like you have been given a second chance? Do you, do you, I want you to remember the face of that father as he hugged that kid. Do you live your life as if you're actually loved to no measure? Do you live in the courage and the boldness of going, I can't believe how God loves me? That teenage boy and that three-year-old, they're going to be telling that story the rest of their life because they've been inspired by the love and the miraculousness of what happened. Do we live our life as if we've been saved from the pit with that joy? If, if not, remember and, and start now. So many of us go, oh, I, you know, I'm busy right now. I, I know I should get plugged into a community. I hear the announcement. There's a rooted table in the lobby, blah, 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 right? If you know you should step towards Christ, start now. Don't, don't wait. Don't wait till next year, next month. If you know you should reconcile with a family member for Christmas, do it now. God gives us one chance at this life. And we're not promised a day beyond today. We're not promised anything. You might have a year to celebrate God. You might have 20 years. You might have today. We don't know. And many of us have stories where we've had the reality that this life has one chance to live put in front of us. And so one more time, this is the Christmas story. That God's love, it, it breaks through into a dark world that all the love in the community of heaven is longing to break through, to reach out a hand, to pull us into new life and to remember and to live in light of it. So we want to respond in, in worship and prayer. And, and we do, we have the prayer wall open because everybody responds differently. Some of you need to get on your knees before God. Some of you need to talk to somebody. Somebody need to lift your hand. Some of you need to have the humility or the courage to go back and say, will you pray with me? I need a next step. But we're going to sing in response. And so what I would invite you guys to do is as we sing this, this last song about who our God is, a um, song by Phil Wickham, uh, that you would stand in honor of the one who broke through from heaven to pull us out of the pit. Let's respond, Grace Church.